Hello, my name is Johannes Hume, and um, I want to again thank everyone for coming today. Um, thank the candidates for coming today. And uh, remind everyone to please turn off your cell phones, put it on vibrator, just turn it off. Um, again, the goal of this event is to have the candidates um, address us in, uh, uh, directly and um, to understand that our vote matters and that all of us need to directly speak with our candidates and um, engage with them on our issues that we find important. Um, this process, we hope, will be an ongoing process where we not only just meet today and ask questions, but even after they're elected, we are able to, um, to have an ongoing discussion and hold them accountable and they can actually um, know that we're still here and that we um, have continuing interest and in issues that we want to discuss. Also, can you please, um, if you do use Twitter, hashtag C-I-R-C-C. -C. Again, hashtag C-I-R-C-C. -C. Thank you. The first, the first candidate is uh, Damon Shadid. For, he's running for Seattle Municipal Court Judge, position seven. And the, um, and could you please just raise your hand? Okay. Thank you. The next one is Fred Bonner, who's, who's running for, um, is it Minnesota? Okay, for a uh, position as a judge, <laughs> sorry. Um, also, uh, we have um, Mark Chow, that's also running for King County District Court, the West Division, District 2. Thank you, thanks for working with us on this. You guys are the first, you're the, the guinea pigs in the tests here, so. Hopefully um, things will go smooth after this. The first question is, do you support sealing all juvenile records automatically? And we'll just start at the end here. Uh, so the question is, is, do I support sealing all juvenile records automatically? And while it is true that as a Seattle Municipal Court judge, I would not be specifically working in juvenile cases, uh, I do have a few opinions on it. Uh, as a judge, I can't comment on pending legislation, and I do believe there are some bills in the House right now that concern sealing juvenile records. But let me just tell you a little bit about my history. Uh, I've been working for the past five years on a bill that would allow people who have non-conviction data on the record, if you got arrested but then the case was dismissed or if the case was eventually dismissed with a not guilty uh, verdict or something like that, I've been working on a bill to allow those people to more easily get that kind of information off their record. And the reason why this is so important is because getting housing and getting jobs is extremely difficult for anybody. But when you have this sort of prejudicial information on your record, it can make it even harder for you and especially when there wasn't a guilty finding. Now, when you're dealing with juveniles, you're dealing with even a more vulnerable population because you're dealing with, uh, with kids who may, um, you have their whole future ahead of them and might have made a mistake. And so it's something that I do believe that we should look at. It's something that we should explore. But like I said, as a judicial candidate, I can't specifically say that I would support that legislation or not support it. But it but whenever you're dealing with these kind of vulnerable populations, youth, uh, immigrants, uh, homeless people, you always have to consider what the effect is of that information being on their record for the all time. And it's something that uh, we can work on. So we're still on the same question. Um, if you want me to repeat it, I can. But um, yeah, so you just came. So um, do you support selling all juvenile court records um, automatically? Thank you. Um, I would actually say that in general, I think that's a good idea. Obviously, there are a lot of things that I come in contact with as a public defender where you have people who had problems when they were juveniles. You know, they have a lot of different uh, influences on them and things happen. And sometimes when those things occur as a juvenile, you don't necessarily want those mistakes of your past when you were young and you hadn't had the time to have good influences on you affect everything going down the road. And if there is something that's necessary to get to, there are obviously processes that you can go and you can look at those records or down the road a future judge can look at those records. But for the juvenile's sake and the fact of really having a second chance and an opportunity to move on past what happens when you're a youth, 
you need to seal those records. And I think doing it automatically means that, for example, if you end up, sorry, if you end up with a client you know, that is pro se and doesn't have the expense to be able to afford an attorney, they might not necessarily know how to get those records sealed where it's something that someone else with access to the financial ability or the understanding of being in a community for a long time and not being of an immigrant population, you could do those things. If it's done automatically, you won't have to worry about that. You won't have to take some kind of extra step that makes it really difficult for you just to try to put something behind you so that you can actually show you were more than that one incident. So, thank you. My name is Fred Bonner, and first I'd like to apologize for not having a jacket on, but I got caught in a rainstorm and coming inside, so I'm a bit wet. Um, as a municipal court judge, we rarely, if ever, uh, deal with juveniles, and I do not automatically believe that we should seal records. I, however, I do believe that there should be a process under which a record could be sealed, depending on the circumstances. Uh, as mentioned earlier, these things, these, uh, cr these offenses that a juvenile occur have long-time consequences. It could pro prohibit an individual from getting subsidized housing, getting education loans, and all of those things. So I do not believe that one should be permanently penalized for juvenile indiscretion. So I do believe that there is a process which allows that a uh, record can be sealed under certain circumstances. And I do support the idea that a person should not be permanently uh, penalized for juvenile uh, indiscretion. So I do support the idea of having a process by which a juvenile can uh, have a record sealed for purposes after a period of time where they have indicated that this was an indiscretion that they have overcome. So. Um, automatic, no, but a, a process, yes, where that can occur. Um, I've been your judge for 23 years. I'm from the South End, um, so I grew up here in the South End. But I think it's important that juvenile records do get sealed because it has ramifications upon all of our children, your children, my children. And it's important that a mistake when they're juveniles doesn't carry against them for citizenship or for, for employment or for education. So I do believe there should be a, a, a strong process to protect juveniles from indiscretions, from trouble they get into, but they're juvenile troubles. The more serious crimes, um, that's a different is issue. But I think having been a judge for 23 years and trying to make sure um, in a people's court where, where people in your community, my community, um, appear that they all get a fair and open uh, hearing. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Kimmy Kondo and I am running for re-election to position two in Seattle Municipal Court. And I know there may be some confusion about who's running against people up here. Judge Bonner and Damon Shadid are running against each other. Philip Tavel and Mark Chow are running against each other. At this point, my opponent um, is not here. And I don't see him here. I don't know that he's going to be joining us today. Um, he didn't join the King County Bar Forum either. So um, I just wanted to let you know that um, I agree with Judge Bonner and Judge Chow. There is case law that addresses this issue to some extent, and there's been recent legislation with respect to juvenile records. And again, one of the things that we need to be mindful of is the fact that juveniles make mistakes. I've got two relatively young young sons and they made plenty of mistakes in their day and I don't think folks should be um, forced to have a juvenile record follow them for their adult life. If they're trying to get into school, if they're trying to find a job, I think that we need to take into account what that 
offense was and perhaps consider sealing those records for a period of time. On the other hand, there is a public right to know, and that's the balancing act that um, the case law has us look at. And so if you're a merchant who suffered losses through theft, then you're going to be concerned that that same person may be applying to work for someone in the future and be in a position of trust and handling money. And so that doesn't necessarily mean that someone should be prohibited from holding that kind of a job, but those are the competing interests that have to be weighed. But I do think there needs to be a process where people can apply to have their records sealed, if not permanently, then for a period of time so that they don't have to bear the consequences of foolish mistakes. Thank you. Do you support treating, treating drug addiction primarily as a public health problem instead of a criminal justice pro pro problem? Oh, we can go start. Yeah. This way, this way. Yeah. Okay. All right, this is Judge Kondo again. Um, Seattle Municipal Court is a court of limited jurisdiction, and the drugs that we address in our court are primarily the central nervous system depressants, which are the alcohol um, types of drugs, and, and trust me, alcohol is a drug. Um, recently, we're seeing an uptick in marijuana offenses because there are plenty of driving under the influence cases that have either marijuana alone or alcohol alone or some combination. Um, the drugs that we deal with are those that do show up in tox screens, such as uh, UAs, such as methamphetamine and, and various other drugs that may show up if a blood search warrant is granted. Um, I don't necessarily think that we need to or that we should treat drug problems strictly as a treatment um, issue. I think that there is plenty of reason and plenty of public policy reasons why we should treat those kinds of crimes as crimes, but I think that after sentencing, there are people that do need treatment, and I don't think that putting someone in jail for a long period of time necessarily guarantees public safety. I think what we need to do is balance the need for um, jail sentences, which is what the legislature has done in creating mandatory minimums with the need for treatment. And the big issue in municipal court is a lot of people need treatment, but they can't afford it. So one of the things that we need to address is who pays for treatment and whether the taxpayer are going to be willing to pay for that treatment for people who are indigent and can't afford that treatment or aren't insured. And so that's, it's, a, it's a much more complicated issue than it might have appear at first blush. But no, I don't necessarily believe that treatment is the only um, response to these kind of issues. Again, my name is Judge Mark Chow. I'm running for re-election for my district court position. So the question posed was, is drug a health problem? And I think if we look at it from a broader sense, I believe that, yes, it is a public health problem. And the reason why I say that is because in our communities, a lot of times, there may need for treatment, whether it's for drugs or whether it's for mental health issues. And a lot of our people need, in the community, need mental health treatment. And if they can't access that treatment, then they start turning to drugs to start satisfying their mental health issues. And that's a lot of times is because they cannot access treatment in our communities. That's why long time ago, I pioneered and, and established the mental health courts in the criminal justice system so that people don't just sit in jail because they can't access treatment and may have a co-occurring uh, problem with drugs and mental health treatment. So I think that's a solution that I've come up with and worked to get it into the court system to try and keep our community members from just sitting in jail waiting for treatment and to, to lessen the, the safety um, problems that we may have in our communities and help the families that are in our communities that are struggling to try and reach out and get treatment for our people, our family members. Thank you. Uh, yes, again, oh, Fred Bonner, Seattle Municipal Court. We have had a, some legislation passed which legalizes certain drugs, which makes certain drugs legal, particularly marijuana. And we are having more and more cases arising out of driving with marijuana, uh, which results in driving while under the influence. So I think we have, should bifurcate 
the kind of cases we're talking about. For those cases that result in harm to other individuals, I think that we do have a drug health issue and it has to be addressed either through therapy or through incarceration. There are other civility crimes where people are suffering from mental health issues that are going un unaddressed where individuals are self-medicating to address those issues. And those issues, I think we should treat those entirely different when they come before us. Now, on those, I think that we need to refer to appropriate sources and have those treated um, in a civil setting rather than in a judicial criminal setting. I'm all in favor of enhancing uh, treatment for individuals who, through no fault of their own, suffer from issues where they cannot directly address mental health issues. And the courts are not really the problem for those, but we do see those individuals in our system. When they come into our system, I think we need to be prepared to address those and refer to the appropriate sources or assist in having appropriate sources and access for those individuals. In the sense where a person is committing a criminal offense as a result of their drug involvement, I think the court is very much involved and has to do its functions as established by the state legislature in addressing those issues. I would like to restate the question before you continue. Um, do you support treating drug addiction primarily as a public health problem instead of a criminal justice program or problem? And then also, I'd like to ask the audience to hold the applause until the entire panel has finished. Damon Shadid, Seattle Municipal Court. You know, the Seattle Municipal Court is the first line where people come in, they're introduced to the court system. You see a lot of people coming into the court for the very first time. You see a lot of people who come in chronically over and over again. And so we have to really look at the municipal court and we have to look at what we think the municipal court can become. Because we're looking at all of our community and, and the goal that everybody wants is one, to rehabilitate people who commit crimes and two, to have community safety. And we have to particularly look at what is actually going to make the community safer. And so when you ask the question, should it primarily be treated as an issue of drug addictions? The answer is yes. But the problem is bigger than that because the problem is it wraps around. Even though we're not going to be prosecuting uh, felony drug offenses in Seattle Municipal Court, so many of the people who are coming through there have drug problems. So many of the people there have mental health problems. Now is the answer to immediately give them a conviction and then say, oh, okay, now we'll give you a little bit of treatment, but when we release you back on the street, you're gonna have this conviction on your record that is never going to allow you to get housing, that's never going to allow you to get work. That is a problem, and that is something that we definitely need to look at. I believe the municipal courts can be more. I believe that we can be a part of the community and a part of the solution to this problem. And so we have to get out of this mindset of just looking at convictions and just looking at punishment. We have to actually look at treatment as well because we are on the front lines. And that's the kind of judge that I would intend to be. Hi, again, my name is Philip Tavel, and I'm running for King County District Court. Um, getting to this question, I actually do think it should be primarily treated as a public health issue. Substance abuse is an incredibly powerful issue and it's incredibly tragic. And people can't deal with issues of substance abuse on their own, they need help. It's not just from friends and family, it's from a system. And we've got a massive system that can provide support. We have things set up to make sure that people don't have those problems and can help deal with them, can get past them, because it takes time. If you have a substance abuse, abuse issue and you're an addict, it doesn't go away. You're always an addict and you're always going to need help and ongoing support. However, what's interesting is the criminal justice system can act as a really important safety net for people that don't get the help right up front for their substance abuse issues. And if those substance abuse issues actually turn into problems with the criminal justice system, as I see all the time, 
People who, without meth or cocaine or alcohol, are wonderful people, who are law-abiding people, and it's those substance abuse issues that cause them to be in front of the criminal justice system. So it needs to be addressed in the, as a public health problem first, but the criminal justice system needs to catch those people and say, hey, this is a chance to get you help, and say to them that if we help you now and help you overcome this addiction problem, you won't come back to the criminal justice system. So I do believe in putting a lot of money into this because it's one of the things that we can do preventatively that can help people. And if they slip through the cracks of the regular system, then the criminal justice system needs to see them and needs to understand that they need help more than they just need jail time. Thank you. Okay, this is the last question. Um, you can just answer with the yes or no. If you are elected, do you promise to meet with the coalition within 60 days to discuss our priorities? Uh, yes, absolutely. The short answer is yes, but I'm going to give a little bit more of an answer. Thank you. Yes. And of your community, yes. <laughs> yes. Thank you. Thank you very much. Once again, we ask you to hold your applause until the entire panel has finished. How can you assure that more minority businesses get contracts for federal projects? Thank you. Thank you. I'm Jason Ritchie. I'm the Democrat running the 8th Congressional District, and thank you for the opportunity. I own and operate a small business, a construction business, Handy Habitats. Uh, I remodel homes for people in wheelchairs with lifts, grab bars, ramps, that kind of thing. Building a small business is something I really enjoy doing, and I can tell you that it's an uphill climb no matter where you're from, what your challenges are, but it's the American dream, and everyone should have a shot at it. And I would support any legislation, any bill, that brings that American dream possibility to more people, specifically for minorities, specifically for immigrants in this community, in this, in this country. We don't spend enough time building that in this country. It's important that you know that your federal representatives are out there trying to open doors, create opportunities. And I want to do that too. Thank you. 80% um, of African American males have criminal records. Are you for re rehabilitating and reintegrating those with criminal records, including felony records, by lifting the restriction on on them receiving food stamps, social security income, federal education aid, grant, state grants, federal housing aid, federal jobs, business licensing, and restoring their rights to vote and serve on juries? Yes, 100%. And I also think that many people don't know that that's what happens when you have been convicted of felony. It has to be about rehabilitation. We have too many people sitting in prisons at too young an age not having a chance to rebuild their lives. And if we put those barriers up in front of them from being able to get back into life and start a new life, we're not doing anybody any good. We're missing out on a lot of talent for youthful indiscretion oftentimes. So I'm absolutely in favor of rehabilitation and knocking down those barriers, yes. Do you know of any specific uh, initiatives in Congress that would help meet some of these goals? Not that I'm aware of, but I would support and try to push forward any that there are. And it's frankly, it's a shame that we're not out there trying to make that happen now. I know that uh, it's an uphill climb with the leadership we have now in Congress. And I think that uh, if we're not spending time building those relationships now, we're going to regret it long term. The Seattle Housing Authority is proposing a new approach to rent structure and employment support for, for what they call work-able households. How can the federal government allow housing authorities and associations to implement policies that hurt vulnerable communities with federal money? Bringing federal money back to this district and this state is essential. It's something our elected representatives here today do a great job of doing already. I would hope to be able to follow their lead and to do that, to help them do that. As, as it relates to housing, there is a huge need for accessible, affordable housing, specifically for immigrant community, and specifically low cost 
housing in this community. And we're not doing a good job of creating the relationships to make that happen. It is the responsibility of the federal government, our representatives, to continue to build those bridges and I would hope to follow the leads of Congressman McDermott and Congressman Smith who are here today. On housing and urban development funded projects, a certain percentage of funds are for hiring and training local low income workers, but not all development projects comply with these regulations. How can the federal government hold state and local go governments accountable? I believe that's the law. They're supposed to do that. They're supposed to train people in those jobs. And to me, it's a very civil prospect. I mean, some of the, just from my own personal experience, one of the largest expenses business owners have are training people and making sure you've got qualified people to go build, for me, build homes, do carpentry work, plumbing work. That's the people I work with every day. And getting people up to those skill sets and being able to trust them and, and grow those relationships, it's a huge investment in time and energy and personal capital. And I think we, we should build projects at the federal level that grow those skilled, middle-class, living wage jobs in our communities. And that, we can do that, absolutely. I strongly favor that. That's why I'm running for Congress, to build those middle-class, living wage jobs in our community. Are there any specific um, initiatives or legislation currently in Congress, or maybe some that you envision proposing, that would meet these goals? of? Uh, the goals that you just outlined. Yeah, I, for me, it's a, it's about infrastructure reinvestment. That's something that I feel very strongly about. We have crumbling roads and bridges throughout our state and our country. It's time to rebuild them. It's time to put those trades to work and invest into those jobs, into those skills, and put those people to work. That takes federal leadership. So I would support legislation and co-sponsor and sponsor myself legislation that would actually bring federal tax dollars, loans and grants that will bring infrastructure reinvestment, new bro bridges, roads, schools, fiber optics in our communities, train people in our communities that don't have those skill sets now to know how to build those roads, build those bridges, build those schools, and that's going to attract new businesses to our communities. If you're elected, will you come, and, um, will you promise to meet with the coalition within 60 days of your election? Yes. Okay, thank you.